Deuteronomy 21. If one be found slain in the land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee to possess it, lying in the field, and it be not known who hath slain him, then thy elders and thy judges shall come forth, and they shall measure unto the cities which are round about him that is slain. And it shall be that the city which is next unto the slain man, even the elders of that city shall take an heifer, which hath not been wrought with, and which hath not drawn in the yoke. And the elders of that city shall bring down the heifer unto a rough valley, which is neither eared nor sown, and shall strike off the heifer's neck there in the valley. And the priests, the son of Levi, shall come near. For them the Lord thy God hath chosen to minister unto him, and to bless in the name of the Lord. And by their word shall every controversy and every stroke be tried. And all the elders of that city that are next unto the slain man shall wash their hands over the heifer, that is beheaded in the valley. And they shall answer and say, Our hands have not shed this blood, neither have our eyes seen it. Be merciful, O Lord, unto thy people Israel, whom thou hast redeemed, and lay not innocent blood unto thy people of Israel's charge, and the blood shall be forgiven them. So shall thou put away the guilt of innocent blood from among you, when thou shalt do that which is right in the sight of the Lord. When thou goest forth to war against thine enemies, and the Lord thy God hath delivered them into thine hands, and thou hast taken them captive, and seest among the captives a beautiful woman, and has a desire unto her, that thou wouldest have her to thy wife. Then thou shalt bring her home to thine house, and she, she shall shave her hair, and pare her nails. And, and she shall put the raiment of her captivity from off her, and shall remain in thine house, and be will her father and her mother a full month. And after that thou shalt go in unto her, and be her husband, and she shall be thy wife. And it shall be, if thou have no delight in her, then thou shalt let her go, whether she will. But thou shalt not sell her at all for money. Thou shalt not make her merchandise of her, because thou hast humbled her. If a man have two wives, one be beloved and another hated, and they have borne him children, both the beloved and the hated, and if the first bun, first burn should be hers that was hated, then it shall be, when he maketh his sons to inherit that which he hath, that he may not make the son of the beloved first burn before the son of the hated, which is indeed the firstborn. When he shall acknowledge the son of the hated for the firstborn by giving him a double portion of all that he hath, for he is the beginning of his strength, the right of the firstborn is his. If a man have a stubborn and a rebellious son which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, in that when they have chastened him will not hearken unto them, then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him and bring him out unto the elders of his city, and unto the gate of his place. And they shall say unto the elders of his city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of his city shall stone him with stones, that he die. So shall thou put evil away from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. And if a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and he be to be put to death, and thou hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. For he that is hanged is accursed of God, that thy land be not defiled, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. Amen. In the... Uh... Psalm chapter 19 and verse 7, it says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous, all to, are, and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than the honey 
and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Just a little uh, testimony here from scriptures from David about the judgments and statutes and laws and commandments of God and how good they are. We're over here in Deuteronomy chapter 21. And as this chapter, as this book has set itself out to be, it's constantly just affirming the judgments of God and, and, and showing how God would judge certain situations among the children of men. Sometimes we look at those and we say, well, that's strange, but as it said in Psalm 19, His way is as pure, endures, true, righteous, just. And we need to remind ourselves of that even when things seem to us to be, oh, that seems off. That, that's not correct. What, what's with that judgment that God just made? He's always right. And here in Deuteronomy 21, we find a case that's no different. We begin in verse 1, and it talks about, And if one be found slain in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee to possess it, lying in the field, and it be not known who hath slain him. So one here is found in the land. No one around, it seems. No evidence of there being somebody present other than this man, except for the case and the state that that man is in. First thing they wonder is who slain him. My first question is, how did they know that he was slain? I think that would be indication of looking. Perhaps they see evidences of, of a struggle or, or signs of, of, uh, of an attack or a weapon that was used or, or who knows. But regardless, they come across this man found slain. And they wonder who hath slain him. And it, it was not known who hath slain him at that time. Verse 2 continues, it says, Then thy elders and thy judges shall come forth, and they shall measure unto the cities which are round about him that is slain. So here's the how-to in dealing with somebody being murdered, and there's no reason that they can pin it on anybody in particular. No evidence indicating that somebody has caused... It's not known who hath slain him. So elders come, judges come, and they're going to start to implement God's justice in this scenario. This is how God would have justice to be carried forth. First thing they do is they measure around about where this took place to the closest city. So simply drawing a circumference, and here is the closest city that we could find. Verse 3, it says, And it shall be that the city which is next unto the slain man, even the elders of that city, shall take an heifer which hath not been wrought with, and which hath not drawn the yoke. So, the closest city then is set to do the sacrifice necessary. Okay, this is how God is going to make sure that the land is cleansed of the blood that has just been spilt upon it. And here's his how-tos. So, they take an heifer which hath not been wrought with, and which hath not drawn the yoke. Verse 4 it says, And the elders of that city shall bring down the heifer into a rough valley, which is neither eared nor sown, and shall strike off the heifer's neck there in the valley. So, the heifer was one that was not wrought with. The place of his sacrifice is a rough valley. And what is that? It says it's neither eared nor sown. And so I go and try to figure out what eared means and then find myself kind of laughing to myself as I, it, the indication of what that means is actually within the text. And it's the same stipulation on the heifer as it is on the valley. And that is, it is not wrought with, neither is it sown. In other words, it's rough, it's wild. There's nothing been done to that by man. And the same is the indication placed and the stipulation placed on the heifer never been wrought with, never been used by man to perform any work. It's an indication here of the innocence in the scenario. This man seemingly died innocent, and there's no justice that's going to be performed upon him. And so they take an innocent, land, or an innocent heifer down to an innocent piece of land, and there they will perform the sacrifice that is necessary. Now, it says that they will strike off the heifer's neck there, in the valley. Now, the first thing that I think of is when a neck is being stricken off is it's severed. Now, that is to me a a clean, a quick, um, unceremonious way to to end a life. It's just gone, right? Now, of course, the um, and I, I always advise against reading the commentaries, but I was tricked into going there 
of my own uh, my own will, I guess, <clears throat> to look up Eard. And in the commentary, they said, strike off the heifer's neck there in the valley indicated a breaking of the neck. Okay, but you just look a little bit down in the uh, in the in the Bible there, and it says that the heifer who was beheaded in verse six, <laughs> the heifer that is beheaded in the valley. See. How, how did the commentary miss out on that, right? They say, oh, this, you know, this is... They had, they had a whole paragraph about why it was broken, the neck. Oh, well, I don't know why they didn't go rewrite it when they went two verses down and it indicated that he was beheaded, but nevertheless, I relent on that one. <laughs> these, these commentaries, you've got to be, you gotta be cautious of them. Sometimes you can get definitions out of them. You can, you can find somebody's mind in a matter, but they're definitely not gospel truth in and of themselves. So... The head is removed in a rough valley, never eared nor sown, and the heifer was one that was never wrought with, never used for man's devices to, uh, to harvest with or to work with. We continue on in verse 5. It talks about now that that has taken place. Verse 5, And the priests, the sons of, the Levi, shall, sons of Levi, shall come near. For them the Lord thy God hath chosen to minister unto him, and to bless in the name of the Lord. And by their word shall every controversy and every stroke be tried. So, I like this because here the priests are coming, and God also gives us another little insight into what their job is in all cases, not just in this fact. It says they are there to try strokes and controversies to determine cases and matters that have gone on among the children of men to determine when there's a controversy who is right and who is wrong to indicate when there's a stroke happen or an action takes place what is god's mind in these things because he is to bless in the name of the lord so there we have their job is to try to minister and to bless these priests and it's interesting because you can take these and then apply to yourselves because the Bible says in Revelation that we are all kings and priests unto God the Father. And so we have that same ministry to try, in other words, to make righteous judgments, to minister, in other words, to do, do work and to serve others, and also to bless, to just be a blessing in general. Go and bless others as you work about and perform your ministry. So these priests show up, and this is what their job was to do. They try the stroke and the controversy. In other words, they're going to try to get to the bottom of this case, and if they can't, because they don't know who did it, then they just oversee what happens with the heifer and with the rough valley and uh, the sacrifice that takes place. Verse 6, it says, And all the elders of that city that are next unto the slain man shall wash their hands over the heifer that is beheaded in the valley. Okay? So the elders come and they're to wash and to confess what it says in verse 7. And they shall answer and say, Our hands have not shed this blood, neither have our eyes seen it. Of course, not referring to the heifer because they would have been there and saw and witnessed the shedding of blood that took place. They arrive and they wash their hands over that beheaded uh, heifer in the valley. They saw what took place, or at least they knew what took place. I think they might have arrived a little bit after because it seemed like justice needed to be carried out swiftly. The elders arrive and the judges, they measure and then they immediately grab the heifer and go down there. It seems like afterwards the priests and the elders, these in particular, show up to this event. And they basically see with the witnesses there that there's no case to put any blame on the people that are around there or anybody in particular for the murder that had taken place. And so they oversee this. The priests then try and bless and minister. The elders wash and confess. So what are they doing? They're washing their hands. It's a, it's a ceremonial indication of I'm not guilty of this blood. They're showing and stating with their mouths that they are innocent symbolically of what took place here. Then in verse 8 continues their prayer. Be merciful, O Lord, unto thy people Israel, whom thou hast redeemed, and lay not innocent blood unto thy people of Israel's charge, and the blood shall be forgiven them. So they ask mercy, they confess that they know not what had taken place, and say, Lord, cleanse us of this innocent blood. And the Bible's clear. And the blood shall be forgiven him. I believe that if this takes place, and they perform the Lord's will, and these 
eight verses exactly as outlined here, God will forgive them of that innocent blood. And that's the promise here the Lord is making to them. Verse 9, it says, So shalt thou put away the guilt of innocent blood from among you when thou shalt do that which is right in the sight of the Lord. And so there's the outcome. The how to get innocent blood off of your land, when indeed it is innocent, is outlined here. When you do what is right in the sight of God, he promises that he will absolve his people of that innocent blood, if indeed it be innocent. Now, I don't think that for all of the abortions in Canada, we could walk out into a field that was not marred by any devices and take a lamb that was not worked upon and perform something like this and have our land absolved because... We know who hath slain these, right? And there's so many other cases where righteously we don't take care of murderers. We simply lock them in a cage instead of shedding blood to absolve the blood that was shed. Therefore, we couldn't go out into a field and then sacrifice an heifer and, and do all that's outlined here and absolve our land of this innocent blood. No, we're too far gone. And these scenarios are ones where there is a clear indication where there's there's clear evidence of who hath slain these that have died but we he, we see here that in old testament israel what they would do in the case of innocent blood that it would be cleansed now as a new testament christian what can we do well we can take diligence to see matters out just in general judgments we can in our own lives symbolically accept blame we saw prophets many times in the Old Testament saying, Lord, forgive our nation for all of our sins, for all of my sins, essentially applying it to themselves, even though I didn't commit all of these atrocities. We can certainly go and in the ministry of intercession, ask for God to forgive our land. It may be too little, too late, but it's worth a shot. God says to pray for our nation and pray for those that are in leadership here. We can also confess and seek mercy. It's the same thing of intercession. Ask Asking with a diligent heart, symbolically accepting blame and confessing the sins of our nation is certainly something that we can do. In the, in the same type of um, example that's given here. Because essentially, the washing of the hands is something that we can do. Because we didn't take part in all of those sins. So we can ask God to forgive. We can ask God to be merciful unto our people here in Canada who could be redeemed but nonetheless our people god's people of spiritual israel are here and god no doubt will protect them and keep them and so perhaps it will be one of these cases like egypt where he keeps his own people israel in the land of goshen while he judges egypt at large and we might find that in canada but we have to have that same mentality we don't know personally who made these atrocities we don't know personally who slew these unborn children and took part in these murders and did all of these abominable things but we can certainly with a diligent heart symbolically accept blame on behalf of our country at large and just ask god forgive ask god cleanse for our sake so that we can live a peaceable uh, time in this earth or, ne or even so that god would have an indication of hey these people are asking forgiveness and these are not and when he judges he will actually do according to that divide that has been made we ought to seek god's mercy at all times for others and also for ourselves and for our families and for believers in christ because judgment is going to fall this blood will not go unatoned for some someone has to pay the penalty for the sins that have taken place in this nation so we intercede in order that we wouldn't be we would be count, counted worthy to escape these things which shall come to pass and see the son of man continuing on in a different topic here in verse 10 i'm just going to read right down to verse 14 when thou goest forth to war against thine enemies and the lord thy god hath delivered them into thine hands and thou hast taken them captive and seest among the captives a beautiful woman and hast a desire unto her that thou wouldest have her to thy wife. 
Then thou shalt bring her home to thine house, and she shall shave her head and pare her nails, and she shall put the raiment of her captivity from off her and shall remain in thine house and bewail her father and her mother a full month. And after that thou shalt go in unto her and be her husband, and she shall be thy wife. And it shall be, if thou have no delight in her, then thou shalt let her go whither she will, but thou shalt not sell her at all for money. Thou shalt not make merchandise of her, because thou hast humbled her. The words of the Lord are true. The judgments of the Lord are right and just. Now, I don't necessarily understand this one. Is this a problem then? Is this something that the atheists can go and use this against me and say, well, what do you think about this? Because in our nation and in our, our time that we live in, this is a strange doctrine, isn't it? This is an unusual thing for us to behold and to hear and to try to comprehend how that works. He takes the wife and then has no desire to her, so he puts her away. The only thing that we see that's really, you know, in my mind that's, that's righteous in it is that he doesn't make money off of it. But the whole scenario seems bizarre, doesn't it? It seems like, like you know, definitely something that someone could arrest and use against the Christian. And they do all the time. They'll take these words and say, oh, you know, God is for slavery and, and kidnapping and stealing people and, and using them because they're beautiful, but then letting them go after the fact. I've heard all sorts of challenges that go against this scripture, but even though I don't understand it, I still believe it. And so my, my, mo my motto has always been when it comes to the scripture, someone can quote any verse at me, well, what do you think about Deuteronomy 21.10 then, right? And I don't even have to look at the scriptures. I just say, I believe it, okay? <laughs> and whether or not I necessarily agree with it, because there are things in the scripture that are lies, are there not? Satan is the father of lies, and he speaks in the Bible, so he speaks lies. But that doesn't mean that I don't believe what he said. I believe that he actually said those words, okay? So I look to that. I don't use what Satan says as doctrine or anything. But something like this, people will use this against us. Well, what do you think about this? This is unrighteous. This is unjust. And you can see all the feminists waving their flags and crying foul because of a scripture like this. But as Christians, we need to have that mentality. Go to 1 Peter 2. Keep your finger there and you can go to 1 Peter 2. We need to have that mentality that believes the Bible no matter what. We believe the word of God. We believe that what was said was true. We believe that what God placed in his scriptures is exactly what he intended to place in his scriptures. And now here we are reading a judgment of God. And we have to, by default, say it's true. It's just. It's righteous. It's perfect. It's pure. It's exactly what God says it would be. There in 1 Peter chapter 2, what we need to do is we need to believe the scriptures and not stumble at the scriptures. 1 Peter 2 and verse 6, it says, Wherefore also it is contained in the scriptures, Behold, I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Look at this. The scriptures, or our King of kings, our Lord of lords, is laid as a precious chief cornerstone in Zion. And he says, Who that, Whosoever believeth on him should not be confounded. We know that the cornerstone, we know that the rock is Christ, and he is referred to as a rock of offense. He offends, even though he's righteous and true and just and, and pure altogether. Now, we continue on and read, and it says, Therefore, it says, Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. And every word of God ought to be the same thing because he is the word. The word was God. The word was made flesh. And we know that when we behold the scriptures here in the King James Bible for the English speaking people, that it is a precious word. It is a true word. And we believe on him. Therefore, he is precious unto us as well. But unto them which be disobedient, watch this, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. They're confounded. As we were promised, we should never be confounded if we believe on it. Those that believe not look at something like Deuteronomy 21, and they're instantly offended and confounded and confused as a result. And they disallow that. 
They reject that. That couldn't be the God that I believe in, the uh, nominal Christian will say. Well, my God is of love. He's the New Testament God, not the Old Testament God. And he wouldn't do such a thing. Or, or the uh, atheist that would just say, see, that's justification that your God is just this, this, this mean and cruel and evil person that hates women. Right? And they'll say all these things, but what reality is happening is that that stumbling stone has become a rock of offense unto them because they believe it not. Default, we believe first every word of God. And that allows us to be in the first part of verse 7. Have Christ, have God as our precious one, our chief cornerstone. And we'll never be confounded if we just by default believe. But if we're disobedient and we're disallowing what God is saying here, no wonder that we fall into verse 8. It says, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But ye, talking back to the believers, are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. What a great position that God puts you in if you'll just believe. Look, we don't need to understand everything the Bible says. We don't need to apply everything the Bible says to our lives in order to fall in the category of chosen of royal, of holy, of peculiar. God asks one thing of that group, and that's believe. And if you believe, he's precious. If you believe, you won't be confounded. If you believe, you're chosen, you're royal, you're holy, you're peculiar, you're separate and distinct unto God, and therefore you won't be offended, you won't stumble, you won't be confounded by even words of God that are set there. And I believe, I'm, I'm a believer, that some things in the Bible are there to simply be a stumbling stone and a rock of offense. And I can take, I can take application of that from something like John chapter 6, where Jesus eventually said to his disciples, will ye also go away? Why? Because he was preaching that they as men ought have to eat his flesh and drink his blood. And they're like, I don't understand that. They ought to have taken the position that I believe what you're saying, though I don't understand that, and therefore stayed with him like the 12 did. They didn't go away. Why? Because they said, thou hast the words of eternal life. Where can we go? <laughs> and we have to have the same thing. Something we read in Deuteronomy 21 seems to be offensive to our 2020 mind. Where can I go? <laughs> thou hast the words of eternal life. And so we look to that and we just believe it. And God will allow us to never be confounded because we've entered into that faith relationship with him. Okay, so we don't believe it, but nevertheless, we shouldn't stumble over it. Go back to Deuteronomy 21. <clears throat> now, the other thing that's interesting about this is because we all want to, they all want to bring up an argument like this and something from Deuteronomy and say, oh, that's just, that's horrible and demeaning to women. But get this. Why are we worried about something like this? When is this scenario ever practically going to play out in your life? Okay? <laughs> we, we worry about something like this, and, and how is this just, and how is this righteous, and how is this what God would want in a scenario? All the while, we're missing the point that on, on the basis level, at the lowest cookie shelf, right? Who's ever going to war against an enemy and bringing home all of these casualties of war and then looking to a beautiful woman and saying i'm gonna marry her and then taking her home and having her shave her head and pare her nails and then discovering maybe just because she's an heathen and an unbeliever and she has all sorts of strange things going on in her world they discover that after the fact because it looks like they just kind of noticed they were beautiful and got home and they're like whoa she's a witch or something like that who knows what the scenario is but i would say it's probably pretty extreme they discovered something pretty extreme he put her away because of it, but he didn't sell her. He didn't make any money. He just said, you're free to go, okay? So when is that ever going to happen? When it does, though, you got a Bible verse to go to on how to deal with it, okay? But for now, we just read it. We just believe it. We just try to meditate upon these things, and that can help you. You can, you can sit around and, and look at these four verses and, and ask God and pray after God and see how this applies to you now, and I think it does. I think there's truth to it, but maybe that's the truth right there. Maybe we just, 
We just found application in 1 Peter 2 that we ought not stumble over that. Just believe it. Just trust that word and just know that God is holy. God is righteous. God is just. He put that there for a reason. And don't be like the rest of John 6, 66 that just turned and followed him no more because they're offended at the word. No, just say, hey, it is what it is. It says what it says. God meant it. I believe it. That settles it. And then get, carry on. And you know what you can do? You can just go to the next verse. Right? Don't let yourself stumble. Don't let unbelievers force you to stumble over words of God like this. Don't get caught in these arguments. Just say, hey, I believe it. If you don't like it, it doesn't matter. I don't, I don't believe my Bible because somebody else likes it, because the whole world likes it. It's not popular. Jesus wasn't popular, okay? So, so we just need to believe it and just move on. No need to get involved in vain jagglings and arguments of these types of things. Don't worry about it. Just, just believe it and don't stumble. Okay, verse 15, in the first part there, it says, if a man have two wives, okay? <laughs> so we know this isn't right, okay? Because I can go to Matthew chapter 19, Matthew chapter 19, having two wives. Just practically speaking, anyone who's had one wife, I'm, I'm joking, <laughs> having two wives is, is, is not a good practical I idea, Matthew chapter 19 and verse 4, and it says, And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? Verse 5, And said, okay, so this is what he that made them male and female said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife. It's a singular verb. And they... Twain, two, shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more twain, two, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. And so here he's talking about divorce, because specifically the Pharisees came to him and asked, hey, can I put away my wife for any cause, just for any old thing, just because I don't like how she cooked the eggs, I don't like how she looked at me, I don't like how her hair looks in the morning, she always leaves clumps of it in the, in the sink, who knows what it is, right? Just any cause, uh, you know, <clears throat> any cause at all. And Jesus, of course, says no. Jesus made them male and female and said, these twain shall be one. And that's how it in was intended to be for always, God put them together, joined them together. Let not man put them asunder. Go back to Deuteronomy 21. So that's clear from the scriptures. If a man have two wives, not right, not a good idea. And I know we have all sorts of Old Testament great men, preachers and prophets alike, kings, that took upon themselves many wives. And every time from Abraham and on, actually there's a case even before that, Esau, Every time it was a bad idea. Every time it brought shame, it brought hurt, it brought confusion, it brought conflict, right? First and foremost, between the wives. My wife likes me to solely be dedicated to her. If there was another that I had to divide my, my attendance to, there would be problems, okay? <clears throat> God is right in his judgment. One man, one woman, these twain become one. And that's how he intended it to be. So we continue on in the teaching there in Deuteronomy chapter 21 and verse 15. He's saying, if a man, okay, have two wives, the one beloved and the other hated, and that's, that's exactly what, what is going to happen, right? It's, it's, it's contrasting, okay? One wife is loved more than the other. And by comparison, as if the one was hated even. And they have borne him children both the beloved and the hated, if the firstborn son be hers that was hated, then it shall be when he maketh his sons to inherit that which he hath, that he may not make the son of the beloved firstborn before the son of the hated, which is indeed the firstborn. But he shall acknowledge the son of the hated for the firstborn by giving him a double portion of all that he hath, for he is the beginning of his strength, the right of the firstborn is his. Okay, God says there is no respect of persons with him. And this is exactly what is playing out here, where the one that was born of the hated wife 
the father's trying to remove the inheritance from him and give it out of respect of persons to the wife's son that he loves. But God here says, no, 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 no. He is the firstborn. He is the beginning of your strength. The right of the firstborn is his, no matter what your relationship with his mom is. He deserves the double portion of the inheritance. Now, again, two wives, not a good idea, but in this fallen world, okay, in with fallen men who have free will, there's always going to be these scenarios that come up, especially when people are saved later in life. People get saved in all sorts of cases. Divorced, remarried, you know, having two wives, you know, all these cases take place for sure. I would think that there's probably in the Muslim world a case like this where someone gets saved and they're like, oh no, I have two wives. And now I have these two sons, and I really love the one wife and this son, and I want to give him the full inheritance. So this might actually be a practical teaching for somebody. What this, what this gives me consolation of is, first of all, God has an ideal for everybody. Clearly, one man, one wife, forever, okay? But there's all sorts of other scenarios that come out because we're in a fallen world with fallen men, and we all have free will to do whatever we will, and some of us didn't all of us weren't saved when we were born, right? All of us were saved later in life. Things happen. Whether you were saved at 10 or 15 or 45, it doesn't matter. This world is messed up, but there is, there, there is a silver lining to this in that the Word of God gives us different ways of navigating some of these problems that come up, okay? So we have here where it's something like, okay, having two wives is not a good thing, but look what God does. He commanded that you can't, you should not have two wives. But then here he goes, okay, but if you do, and God is going to give even those that have fallen short of his perfect will for their lives, right? He's given them a way to navigate that. And I believe the scriptures are full of this. I believe that if you look hard enough and you pray honestly, that anybody that's in a situation of relationships that is not ideal, they can look to the scriptures and God will guide their lives on how to navigate even once you've fallen short of God's perfect will for you. Look, some of us didn't even know the Lord and we'd already fallen short of his perfect will for us. Don't, don't let that beat you up. Don't let that kick you down. Don't let that be a, a, a mark on your Christian life. Just simply put those things, forgetting those things which are past, press on towards the mark, the prize of the high calling. I'm not standing up here with a different testimony. Ideally, I would, have been, I would have been saved at a young age, never would have got involved in the things that I did when I was in high school in my early 20s. I never would have done any of those things that I now regret and look back on and I'm like, man, I wish I had never done that. I wish I had met my wife when I was like 15 years old, the second I got saved and then we got married three or four years later and started having babies and now we'd have like 20 of them and you know... Ultimately, that would be my ideal, and I believe that would have been God's ideal for me. But, you know, th this world is what it is, okay? And, and the, the, problem, the problems that are here are not unique to just one or two of us in particular. All of us have passed. Let it go, move on, press on. And here we see just another example of that, that God gives provision for even people that fall into sins that they can't undo. What do you think would have been a righteous thing for him to be like, oh, man, I got two wives... God says no, and then just kick the one to the curb and just, okay, now I'm good, right? No, that wouldn't have been right. God gives a way to navigate the scenario that they're in. We don't know necessarily even here that it's just the man that hates it. Maybe the woman just has this relationship with her husband. I, we, don't, we don't know all the scenario, but we do see that whatever the case, it should not dictate God's proper order here that the firstborn in the beginning of the strength has that right to inheritance. So God says, hey... This is an ideal, but here's how you perform my perfect will in this situation. We can continue on in verse 18. And here's another one which people love to attack, atheists and unbelievers alike. If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, verse 18 in Deuteronomy 21, which will not obey the voice of his father. Now look at this. He is a stubborn and rebellious son, meaning he's got a hard head. He's not going to budge. He's not going to move. He's not going to change from his own personal direction. And his direction is one of rebellion. In other words, here's the order. 
he's going to stand over here and do the opposite of it every time. He's a rebellious, stubborn son. It says, which will not obey the voice of his father. So he's in a scenario where he ought to obey the voice of his father, and he refuses to, and also the voice of his mother. And it says, and that, now watch this, when they have chastened him, will not hearken unto them. So this is the, this is the scenario. He's rebellious. He ought to obey the voice of his parents. Refuses to, even after they have chastened, he will not hearken unto them. Then it says this in verse 19. Then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him. Now look at that. They both had to do it. <laughs> they both had to lay a hold on this son, showing that it's not a toddler. <laughs> it's not an infant. Right? It's not a little it's not a, a, a little child. Father and mother had to lay hold on him. It's gonna be a long time before I need mom's help to subdue Caleb, right? It's gonna be a long time. I I, I I've, I'm gonna be in my eighties when I need help from you know to, to manhandle Caleb. I'm gonna get that old man's strength and he's never gonna be able to take his dad down. I I promise you. Okay. <clears throat> Here, father and mother were needed to lay hold on him. And it says, and bring him out unto the elders of the city, unto the gate of that place. So they drag forcibly the son out there. And it says in verse 20, and they shall say unto the elders of the city. Now notice, they didn't just decide this on their own. They actually bring the son, lay him before the elders, and, and, and begin to testify what they have found of this child. First of all, they're going to say he's stubborn and rebellious. Then they're going to say he will not hearken. We've chastened him. Now watch this. Our son, this our son, is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. And watch this. On top of that, he is a glutton and a drunkard. Okay? So this child adds unto the sin bad enough, right? And, verse 21... All the men of the city, all the men of the city, all the men of the city shall stone him with stones that he die. So shalt thou put away evil from among you. And watch this. And all Israel shall hear and fear. So the scenario is this. This child is so stubborn, rebellious, a drunken, glutton, just a rotten child. It's calling him a son, actually. We don't even see the word child here, I don't believe. This son is... All of these things, a glutton and a drunkard above that, brought by father and mother after chastening had taken place, after pleading with him, I believe, had taken place, after the voice of the problem was made, he would not obey. The elders see and acknowledge, yep, he's all these things. And then all the men of the city willingly show up to stone him with stones. You think this son deserved it? Everybody's got the same judgment. He's, he's one of these, like, derelict, just sitting at home, eating chips off his chest, playing video games, drinking, partying, not listening to anybody. He's old enough that he should be doing something decent with his life, and he's not, and everybody knows it. It's not some, some strange thing unto them, because they all come. Don't you think if there was even one man that was like, no, he's got a chance. This, this, this boy can turn his life around, mm -hmm. that he would have said something and been like, all right, I'm not throwing the stone. Look, all of them had to take part in the stoning. All of them had to make that righteous judgment. So if even one said, no, he's fine, then I don't think it would have taken place. The intent was that that child that, or that son that certainly deserved it was judged, and it says in the end, and all Israel shall hear and fear. Not only did the whole town take part in the judgment, but all Israel at large heard and had fear come over them for what had taken place. It was a great reminder of you don't want to end up. This guy would probably become a proverb. Don't end up like Joe. Old Joe never left his house. He was, he was a drunk. He was a glutton. His parents told him what to do and how to live. And, and they tried to chasten him and tried to set him right. And old Joe just wouldn't do it. So he turned 20 years old. And it was time for him to get a life. And he wouldn't. He refused to get a life. So we all got together and we stoned old Joe. And then they looked to the 15-year-olds and say, Don't end up like him! And they're all like, yeah, okay. And they're, they're willing to stay up, stand up and, and straighten up and fly right because of the testimony of a, of a byword, of a glutton, of a drunkard, of a stubborn, rebellious, awful individual that everybody testified of that same truth about him. He was destroyed in order that evil would be put away. Okay? 
That's a good thing. That's a righteous judgment. And the world will look at that and be like, oh, that's so rotten. And I kept doing it just by, by slip of the tongue, putting child in there. But this is not a child. This is, this is a grown man that ought to be doing right, and he refuses. He's acting like a child. But the Bible says, when I became a man, I put away childish things. I think the, the, the inner testimony of scriptures is that if you're not willing to put away childish things and that becomes a detriment, hey, God's judgment is clear. Stone him with stones. Put him without the camp and make him an example unto everybody else who would afterwards live ungodly. Continuing on, after seeing the solution for stubborn, rebellion, rebellious, drunken gluttons, verse 22 it says, And if a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and he be put to death, and thou hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night upon that tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day, for he that is hanged is accursed of God, that thy land be not defiled, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. So here's another example of how to properly carry out justice. A man's hung on a tree. Now, I don't believe, though the Bible refers to as cursed as any man that hangeth on a tree, and talking about Christ, I don't believe that this is actually a crucifixion in particular. I think it's probably what we're more used to, where there's a rope and somebody's hung. Just because history tells us that crucifixion started with the Romans, and here we are in Old Testament Israel when... when uh, Egypt was one of the main kingdoms, not necessarily Rome. Rome came much, much after in the act of crucifixion. But the, the same principle stands, and I believe for whatever reason, it was, it was, whether it was because it was prophetically said or because the Jews were trying to uphold the finer points of the law, you know, straining out a gnat, swallowing a camel. I'm going to keep the law and take Christ down before sunlight. Meanwhile, they're crucifying Christ Jesus, their Savior, right? Straining out a gnat, swallowing a camel, tithing and mint and anise, and omitting the weightier matters of, of the law and actually following and believing on their Savior, right? <clears throat> For whatever reason, cursed is he that hangeth on a tree. So God says, don't let them hang all day that your nation would be accursed, but take them down and, and, and put them in the ground. So they would hang them. There would be a time that would, that, that would be... They'd be up there, and then they would, of a surety, take him down, put him in the grave or, or wherever they would need to be, bury him that day, and that would be the finality of that form of execution. So, uh, again, good judgments. Some of these things, again, have been challenged by atheists, but we just walked through them, and I think we can all agree that these, these seem like righteous judgments, even if they're just teaching us that we ought not shy away from certain scriptures. I would have no problem going to a, a Bible chapter like this and walking some unbeliever through and explaining it, how it's righteous and just of God. Because I've studied it and I've looked into it, and I'm like, you know what, that's, that's righteous and that's just. I believe God is making the right decision here. He always makes the right decision. But in reality, you know, if somebody throws something at you like this, and they're like, well, explain that. 99.9% .9 of the time, no explanation is going to help. Right. And I found this, whether it's Old Testament laws that seem unjust, or whether it's James chapter 2. I don't know how many times I've, 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 like, you know, I've felt the Spirit of God come upon me, and I preach at a door, like, what I feel because of the power of God was like the greatest sermon on James chapter 2 and I'm going to all the finer points and it's it's expounded perfectly and I'm like see faith without works is dead but you're saved by faith and and I just I just you know put that climax on it and and it it comes out with a perfect conclusion and they're just like yeah well I believe you got to do some works to be saved you know People don't, they don't take you to these confounding scriptures, these stumbling stones, the things that are a rock of offense to them. They don't bring you there because they're softened to hearing what you say and they want to believe it. They bring you there because it's just another way to excuse their unbelief for God and they can walk away and say, ah, he's a rotten guy, right? So learn these things for yourself. Grow in these types of scriptures and know them. But ultimately, when somebody brings you and says, well, what about... Deuteronomy 21 and, and, and taking captive of beautiful women, you know, they're not going to be swayed. 99.9% .9 of the time, they're just trying to get into an argument. And we ought not get involved in these types of vain jangling sorts of things. So what I do by default 
If somebody brings that up at a door or if I'm talking to somebody or whatever, I just say, I believe it. Let's get back to the gospel. Because you, you will spend all day at Deuteronomy 21. And, and like I said, you'll spend all day at James chapter 2. And you will just expound it. Oh, yeah, that was good. Thank you, Lord, for that wonderful sermon. And it won't do anything. Because ultimately they didn't want to believe. They stumbled at the stumbling stone. And in actuality, it says there in, uh, in 1 Peter 2, it says, as they were appointed. So th- they were appointed to stumble at that and to unbelieve because of that. That's why God even put some of these verses there. I believe that with my whole heart. But don't stumble, Christian. Just look at the words and believe the words. If you don't understand it today, ask God to show it to you tomorrow. And you know what? By the time you start reading and you're in Deuteronomy 22 and 23, there's going to be other things to learn. And you'll probably forget about that verse until the next time you do your Bible study. And you'll be like, oh, yeah, what about that one? I forgot about that one. God, show it to me. And it's just not your time yet. Sometimes there's so many things in there. I mean, the Bible is so deep, you will never get it all, this side of heaven. You'll never understand the word of God, this side of heaven. One day God will personally explain it to you. And I bet you there will be things that even you thought you knew. That you're like, oh man, I was totally wrong in that. Just, just because by nature the word of God is perfect, true, just, righteous, and you're not. So <laughs> that, that's the thing there. So anyways, thank you, Father, for this day.